for research uh, of mine, uh, which emerged during the time then, uh, um, during the time of which I led uh, a new funded project on AI, right? It was uh, Future Law, Ethics, and Smart Technologies. And today, I would like to talk a little bit about are super intelligent robots entitled to human rights? So obviously, uh, that is not something that is just around the corner, right? So we are not talking about um, midterm, um, we talk about long term uh, possible impacts, okay? Um, so why? There are th motivations, three points really. Uh, first, it is a valuable uh, thought experiment, right? In moral philosophy, uh, we are quite interested in topics like what is the moral status of something, right? And here, what is the moral status of non-human artificial life? That is the first thing. Uh, the second is we gain more knowledge about our ethical theories and uh, our key concepts, right? When AI researchers say, by implementing these uh, ethical systems on the computer, we learn uh, quite a bit of um, what are our ethical theories, what are the knowledge and assumptions about these, okay? By building these uh, systems. And of course, the third point, um, being prepared for the event of intelligent robots in the future, right? So in 50, 80, or 100 years, we will definitely see a very, very fancy uh, robots that might be even super intelligent. So it comes with huge social, political changes, and therefore we need to start now to think about these issues, and not when it's too late, right? So we shouldn't uh, make such a mistake. So, and today, um, after a brief introduction, I would like to present two concepts of personhood, which are important because we always relate in philosophy the concept of personhood, of person, to rights, okay? And then I will share a slide with you from full moral status to more than full moral status, thinking the impossible, and then I will come up with some critical uh, remarks. Okay, but first, what is artificial intelligence and then the hypothesis? Uh, a definition, uh, AI is the ability of a digital computer or computer-controlled robot to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings the term is frequently applied to the project of developing systems endowed with intellectual process, so it's characteristic of humans such as the ability to reason, discover meaning, generalize or learn from past experience. That is one definition of uh, what artificial intelligence is. So I work with this uh, definition usually. Uh, Copeland, uh, he has this nice entry uh, on the Britannica on artificial intelligence. Um, then, by hypothesis, okay? Super intelligent robots are not only entitled to human rights, so to speak, but they also have be higher moral and legal status compared to human beings once they exist. That is the hypothesis, and we will see whether this uh, is something that we can uh, work with or not. But before we come to that, um, I will briefly introduce you to the rationality autonomy approach of personhood and then the relational approach. Relational approach, for those of you who have listened to social robots, that is something that might come in here quite handy as well. Okay, let's get started. Um, Kant's concept, um, rational persons have the capability to decide whether to act or not to act in accordance with the demands of morality, right? That's, that's the basic thing. And then the ability to make decisions and determine what is good has absolute value according to Kant, okay? And the ability to make such decisions gives these rational persons an absolute value as well. And a rational person can act autonomously with respect to, for example, moral principles, okay? And rational persons have dignity according to Kant insofar as they act autonomously, okay? Acting autonomously makes persons morally responsible. Such a being has more personhood. And when you think about this, um, my own approach has been dubbed a uh, new Kantian approach of uh, personhood in the context of um, AI ethics. And uh, that is really true because I think that when you take the idea of rationality as your corner piece, so to speak, then you're quite close uh, with respect to a Kantian approach, okay? So, but you can of course 
criticize this approach, and there are two uh, ways of um, uh, doing so. One is rationality as a precondition of moral agency. So, of course, when you take this very strong uh, concept of um, rationality, that would, for example, exclude most of the animals. Um, utilitarians would always say, no, it's about pain and suffering. Um, also in the context of disability studies, when you, when you talk about um, um, fetuses with, with mental impairments and people with mental impairments, so they tend to have a, a relational account, okay? So the second thing, intelligent robots as more agents and not as more patients. Yeah. Direct duties versus indirect duties. Uh, what does that mean? Direct duties means if you have this fancy um, uh, robot, let's say, right, um, you have or you can have direct duties towards this robot because it has rights based on the autonomy and rationality. If you say, no, uh, only humans can have rights and still want to, let's say, protect the robot, you can say with Kate Darling, um, you need to treat these fancy robots well because if you mistreat them, uh, it might have negative consequences in your dealing with your fellow um, uh, members with your fellow humans. It's an indirect duties approach, according to Kant, with respect to animal rights, okay? So she uses that in the context of AI ethics uh, so that we should treat social robots of today even uh, well because it might have negative consequences. The relational concept of personhood, so the social model of autonomy is central here. So autonomy is not individual, but it stands in the context of social relations, you can say, right? mother and fetus or newborn, for example, okay? And the concept of a person should be seen uh, as a social category, really, okay? Personhood, they say, is absolute and it's inherent in every human being as a social being, okay? And that is very important um, because um, if something is absolute, you can't take it away from, from that uh, being, okay? And the idea really is, um, it is an interactionist model of personhood. That means uh, the model of personhood is by nature relational, but it is not necessarily reciprocal. Think about the fetus, okay? So there's no, let's say, action on behalf of the fetus. It can be non-responsive. And still, um, the people who hold up the re relational approach would say no, uh, independently of whether the fetus um, may not be um, cognitivist, so rational, uh, it still is a person and therefore it has rights, okay? And in particular in the context of AI ethics, um, you see here um, David Gunkel, for example, in Robert Wrights is pushing this agenda, but also Mark Kuckelberg in his uh, uh, paper, okay? So what about uh, the comments? So first of all, more importance of social relations. I think that is very clear that social relations are the basis for solidarity among people and with respect to animals, okay? But we can of course ask the question whether uh, there is also more significance uh, of rationality, okay? And usually we would say social relations may uh, help to implement new members of the moral community, okay? It's very important that you, know, you, you, you establish uh, social relations, but they are not the reasons why we should ascribe more rights to them, okay? Because as you know, history has shown that uh, we have something like um, exclusion, social exclusion, okay? Uh, based on the idea that no, we don't want to uh, deal with certain uh, groups of people, and that's why that might be um, a big issue, so to speak, okay? So why uh, is moral status uh, important? Uh, moral status is important because an entity or an entity's moral status determines its claims to moral rights. So if an entity has no moral status, then people say it has also no moral rights, okay? Um, and what grounds moral status? Um, Frances Kamm in her book, Intricate Ethics says, okay, and what grounds more status is either sapience, or the ability to reason, or sentience, the ability to suffer, feeling pain, having emotions, or both, okay? It can also be uh, uh, both, so to speak. 
here, very briefly, oh, by, the, by the way, we have 21 slides, so we are close to end, so I hope I make it 20 minutes, so to speak. Okay, so in the middle we have the human beings, um, and the human beings usually are in the center, uh, so to speak, of um, uh, the moral circle, okay? Then people say, okay, even within human beings, um, there are differences, at least historically speaking, but now as, as, as we uh, take on the human rights approach, we say that we have the moral equality here. And the animals are now our next big uh, um, issue. Uh, talk about animal rights. Yes, they are in the moral circle now. And even according to some people, plants have, uh, have some, let's say, moral consideration as well. You know, these big trees that are 300 years old, 50 meters high, uh, do you go there and, and cut your uh, wood for the fireplace? Most probably not. You, you, you may have concerns about that, okay? And now the idea is, what about these intelligent robots? And I'm not talking about robots of today, but in the future, okay? Very, very fancy one. Should they be included in our moral reasoning and decision making um, as well? And here, this is really the, the centerpiece. Sorry. This is really the centerpiece. Don't worry, I guide you. Uh, we are talking about the moral status, or we talked about the moral status here. And Francis Kamm, as, uh, as, as I described, said either sentience or sapience, okay? But what about uh, fetuses, newborns, toddlers, or most animals? And according to a colleague, Jeff McMahon from Oxford, he says, okay, they are, you know, they, they are not really uh, sapiens, okay? They do not have the ability to reason and rationalize and this and that. Yes, they are sentient, but um, we need to make a, a distinction between, let's say, the typical adult human being or mature children and, let's say, most other animals, uh, whether it's a dog or a cat or whether it's an earthworm. Obviously, an earthworm has not a moral status, okay? And he says, okay, um, these entities may have an intermediate moral status, okay? And th this is the, the, common, the common standard view, so to speak. And here you can say, okay, what happens in between, that is a degree model, okay? The higher the ability is, the higher or the more you are rational, the more morally important the being is, okay? Um, same with sentience. If you take sentience as your corner piece, uh, then you also have a degree model based on the ability of sentience, okay? Um, then the question is, okay, can we have something like a full moral status? A full moral status, as I mentioned, could be, for example, that you have both. You have a full, the full ability of uh, sentience and you have the full ability of sapience. So who is that? Usually we would say the typical adult human being, mature children. Okay, and now think about, um, and this is, a, um, uh, this is a, a something that has been discussed in philosophy for a long time, human enhancement, transhumanism, for example. Think about uh, the idea that you have a human being who is really, really um, super intelligent, way more intelligent than all the others taken together, so to speak, right? I mean, I'm now overdoing it in order to make my point. So then people would say, at least the discussion was like that, that these special human beings, okay, these cognitively enhanced human beings, they should also have more rights, okay? Because if you um, have a degree model here and you say, okay, there's your ability to, to rationalize is much bigger, then, and this is coupled um, um, or related to rights, then obviously you can make an argument that these fancy human beings, they should have more rights as well, more moral rights as well. Um, and then the idea is, okay, what about these super intelligent robots? They are obviously much smarter, at least in theory, as, as human beings. Should they be entitled to more moral rights as well? And depending on uh, the degree model, they should, okay? Unless you say, okay, that's a bit scary, right? So maybe we should have a threshold model saying that independently of whether you are much smarter here, you will still have the same moral rights um, 
uh, compared to people who, are, who only have the full moral status, so to speak, right? But you can, you can say so, but it would be not in line with the argument here, okay? So you need to be very you know, clear about this. If you have a degree model here, you should also have a degree model there because other, otherwise you are inconsistent, okay? But okay, that is the threshold. Now, uh, I, I formulated this in, in I, I can skip the two slides in, in, um, in wording, and now the critical remarks. Um, first, do not produce super intelligent robots in great numbers, and why being incoherent might not be morally wrong. So, the idea is, of course, with super intelligence, that people um, sometimes have an, a bizarre idea that even the vacuum cleaner sh is, is super intelligent. That is so bizarre, right? Um, obviously, when you know the, the Star Trek uh, uh, data character, there's only one super intelligent uh, uh, being, right? Um, so that, you, that, that all the room bars or what the names are are super intelligent or become super intelligent is completely bizarre. Okay, but still the idea is how many of these fancy robots do we want to have, okay? What should be the number B? And the idea here is um, people voiced concerns that there might be an existential risk, okay? It could uh, be that um, depending on the size of, of the, 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 the numbers of the robots, it can become an, an, a real concern, existential risk, an AI revolution. For example, as, as Bostrom has, has voiced and, and um, uh, and uh, to be ought in 2020 as well. So they are concerned that if the robot's um, moral compass, so to speak, um, is not in line with our values and norms, okay, then they might take over and uh, exploit us uh, instead of vice versa, okay. Um, or it can come to a fight for global resources, right? So they need resources as well. You know, they, they need to be built uh, that takes um, resources as well. So it's not, it's not a, um, a game where you have plenty of resources. No, it's not. Or the idea is that, okay, if you have these fancy robots and systems, um, at some point they will do most of the work for us. Okay? And then people say, okay, that would be really harmful because that would undermine our autonomy. Okay, um, think about uh, a car mechanic, okay? Um, there will be no people around in 100 or 150 years who are able to fix cars because everything is done by robots. So at some point, this happens with other jobs or tasks as well, okay? So um, there is a kind of, as some people say, degeneration uh, ongoing at some point. You lose, or human beings lose the cognitive capabilities, okay? If uh, you, you imagine, uh, it's a scary, uh, a scary uh, image, a world where everything is done for you. you. You do not have to do anything. If you want to know something, you just ask the computer, okay? Just ask ChatGPT plus plus, so to speak, at that time, right? Um, you don't need to do anything. Everything is provided for, so to speak. It's, um, it, for some, it's paradise. For others, it's uh, dystopia, okay? Or another point is, the problem of human boredom. Yeah, you, we become lazy and, and stupid, you know, if everything is, is organized uh, for us in some ways. Um, so now, what about the incoherence approach? So we say that super intelligent robots will be much smarter than human beings. Okay, much smarter entities are entitled to a more than full moral status. Okay, they are the supra person, so to speak. And entities with a higher moral and legal status have stronger and most likely moral more moral and legal rights, okay? However, as some could argue, robots are not human beings and hence should never uh, count morally or legally more than us, so to speak. So what can we say uh, about that? There are at least three objections that you can come up with. One is that the incoherence approach is misleading since it illegitimately, illegitimately favors the human species over other non-human species. So uh, that is a famous kind of objection that was made in the context of uh, animal rights, uh, speciesism, okay? That is basically racism on the levels of species, 
Okay. Or you can say, with Kant or neo-Kantian approach, the ontological reasoning being incoherent amounts to being irrational, which in turn is morally wrong. And lastly, if the entity is a moral and legal person, then one must not violate their moral and legal rights. Okay. And the last slide. Conclusions, the moral and legal status of an entity determines its claims to moral and legal rights, and that is a given. The possibility that suprapersons, and this also includes the superintelligent robots, okay, may exist at some future point cannot be ruled out. Okay. And then suprapersons might be entitled to more or stronger rights depending on which scenario you favor. So either the degree or the threshold model. Okay. So, thanks a lot. Uh, I know it was a long day uh, for me as well, so uh, thanks and uh, thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you very much, Zon Stewart Gordon. John, you have emphasized the role of rationality. Yeah. Vincent, you have emphasized the significance of the objective function. Vincent, do you believe that we can decouple rationality and the objective function? Or is it in this way that a full rational agent has also a rational objective function? Maybe a social beneficial objective function. We are very interested to have your opinion. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think this sometimes goes by the title of uh, the orthogonality thesis, uh, pointing back to Bostrom's work. Right? Is it possible for an entity that is uh, in, let's say, always more intelligent than us to have an objective function that is, in some sense, not very sophisticated? Right? Uh, Bostrom and the literature around him often consider this example of a paperclip maximizing artificial intelligence system that somebody instructed it to, uh, to, to make as many paper clips as possible. Right? Maybe they had um, a, a paper clip factory and they said, well, let's have the super intelligent AI system take over the factory. Uh, so, and, and we'll just give it as its objective, like make as many paper clips as possible. That's the goal. And, and the worry is then as the system becomes super intelligent, it realizes, oh, I could do much more than just have this factory. I'm going to build factories everywhere. And these humans are kind of getting in the way of uh, me making more paper clips. So I'm just going to eliminate all the humans and in extreme versions, like get, extract the iron from their bodies to make more paper clips. Uh, so it seems a bit uh, a fanciful scenario. But there's this question of is, that, is something like that possible, right? Would, any, would a super intelligent AI system really uh, be okay with any objective function that it might have uh, obtained somehow, or would it more naturally, uh, on its own, figure out that wait a minute, you know, maximizing the number of paper clips just isn't the right thing to do? This gets to questions about moral realism as well. Uh, you know, do, do we think there's some? Uh, that that sort of any intelligent entity would in the end be able to discover kind of the right ways to proceed in the world. Um, I think it's a really interesting question, and you know, traditionally in AI, this hasn't really been such an issue because uh, systems haven't been super intelligent. They haven't had kind of a, a general broad understanding of the world that we feel is necessary to do moral reasoning. Uh, maybe now we're getting somewhat close with uh, large language models. At least having some kind of broad understanding of the world, though, is you know, it's still limited in various ways. Um, but yeah, at some level, I suppose that is an experimental question, right? That will these systems automatically tend to converge to certain kinds of objective functions, hopefully ones that we would consider morally good? Uh, or is that just wishful thinking and is something like the paperclip maximizing super intelligent AI system that in spite of its super intelligence cares only about maximizing paperclips, is that possible? Uh, and which I think is a really interesting philosophical question, but also one that has uh, real consequences, maybe even already today a little bit as to how we uh, try to guide these large language models, if you've heard of uh, uh, Bing chat and all the ways that that went wrong. Um, what can we kind of expect uh, various guidance to these AI systems to result in, uh, in terms of what they optimize? And I think at some level we just don't really know yet. And I think you are interested in responding. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. 
Okay. John, you agree and um, do you think that your future will be social beneficial? I think that's already proven that I'm social beneficial. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, uh, with, with respect to uh, super intelligence, um, as a side note, um, um, and the paperclip example uh, uh, given by Bostrom, um, it seems to be um, first at least uh, a bit of bizarre, <laughs> bizarre example. But on the other hand, if you uh, uh, think more deeply about it, um, despite the paperclip, what about um, the, let's say, moral views or moral values of such a super intelligent being, right? Uh, when it's a self-learning uh, system, um, then we better make sure that uh, at least uh, we show the system that it should be in line with our values and norms that uh, we hold dearly, okay? Um, independently now whether the system may think, oh, we have some better uh, uh, values or norms, uh, you should um, uh, just ab abide by our values and norms, right? Um, so it's, it will be an interesting conversation um, in 50 or some plus years, so to speak. Uh, but uh, I think it's very valuable and important to uh, think about these issues now um, and uh, not, to, not to be confronted uh, with such issues without having thought about them in the first place. Mm -hmm. Others say even if you take Joanna Bryson, um, we need to slow down uh, research on AI because uh, we simply uh, don't know whether this will have negative impact on, uh, on us, for example, right? Uh, another, another issue is how to slow down this globally because there will, s there will of course, be either states or institutions uh, doing still research on AI and they have a big advantage um, over the others when they do so. So it's, it's a very, very significant uh, topic uh, um, that we will see, you will see it. Uh, I guess um, um, you are younger than I am, so um, uh, it will certainly be an interesting time, I, I suppose. Yeah. Thank you very much. Of course, we need a third day yeah, to extend this discussion. But Vincent, I'm, I'm really curious about your opinion. Slowing down research of AA, what do you think about this? Maybe you could give us a short answer. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And again, for most of my career, I've been a, uh, an AI researcher. Um, so maybe I have uh, some biases in that regard. Uh, I would say, first of all, there there's lots of different types of AI research, right? Um, some of it is building ever larger models, like the large language models, and just trying, trying to scale them, which has worked remarkably well, right? I think um, just about everybody in the AI community is actually quite shocked that how much apparent reasoning these large language models are able to do just based on uh, having been trained on all kinds of uh, language data. Um, but of course, there's also AI research on other approaches where we have a better understanding of what the system does. There's a lot of research on uh, on ethics in AI now as well, and you know, and these kind of alignment questions of how do you actually get the system to do what you want, or what can we learn about these systems? So for, uh, I think you know, shutting down all research that is related to AI may not be the right way to go, but we might want to think a little bit about what kinds of research uh, we want to encourage more than others, right? Economic Maybe research? Like, economic research on AI? Uh, that's that, that's sure, yeah. Uh, that's, Thank that's you. <laughs> that's an applause <laughs> for you. <laughs> okay. I think that is an yeah. important topic, right? Vincent. But you could reasonably say, well, should we just keep growing er ever larger models without any particular guidance just to see what will happen? Uh, you could reasonably have some concerns about that. Yeah. Um, but also, yes, it is difficult to maybe shut that down everywhere, uh, right? So this really would require some kind of treaty uh, to even achieve, right? Because there do seem to be strong incentives from various purposes to just build larger and larger models and see what Vincent. will happen.